Have you got slides, Rosie? Yes, I do. Shall I? No, it's, it's, you can you can if you want to load them up, and I'll uh, I'll just do a quick intro. This is people who arrive. I think we will get started. It's two minutes past. Give everybody a chance to to roll in. Um, thank you everybody for joining again this this month. Um, another packed agenda, uh, which uh, which is always good because lots of people want to share lots of really good stuff. So uh, that's the reason why we've moved these now to monthly. So from next month, you should have invites in your diary uh, for for once in, for a monthly meeting, which will give us a chance to share more of the good stuff that's um, that's happening around the country. Uh, which is always good to hear because that was the purpose of this group really is to um, less about me talking and more about you guys talking because we want to hear what everybody's doing and share details and inspire each other that fundamentally is what we're trying to trying to achieve so we've got um actually today we've got a uh, team from Royal free talking about the move campaign um jackie holmes from uhb that's, that's birmingham uh, talking about all things eat, drink, dress, move. I uh, had a chance to go over and see Jackie a few weeks ago. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you had a chance to see the the recording from that, but that's another fascinating um, uh, piece of work happening there. Uh, then I think we've got Cindy, Cindy Store from Rotherham. Uh, I think I think see if Cindy, Cindy's on you. Cindy learned about the EDDL. Oh, there we are. Just popped up on the screen. Good stuff. Learned about the EDM, EDDM work, and there was some work already happening in Rotherham. Uh, and then Cindy and the team learned about the work that was happening in uh, UHB and has uh, taken that and run with it magnificently. So there'll be a natural transition from Jackie onto Cindy. And then um, the brains behind the original winter deconditioning games, uh, Deb Whitaker from the East of England is going to throw an idea at everybody and see what we think about um, an idea around Mental Health Week this year, which is uh, the theme is around movement and keeping active. So uh, Deb's got a bit of an idea on that one. So we will share that one with you and have any thoughts around that. So uh, if that's a, all right with everybody, we'll get started. I'm going to throw over to Rosie and the team from Raw Free um, to share what you've been up to in North London. OK, thanks so much, um, Nick, and all the team for um inviting us to share this with you um, today. Um, so I'm Rosie Skripak. I'm a clinical lead occupational therapist at the Royal Free Hospital um, in Hampstead, but I also have my colleague, the two Emmas, um, we're representing the Royal Free London. So Royal Free London is um, made up of the Royal Free Hospital in Hampstead, Barnet Hospital and Chase Farm. And um, we're gonna be talking about what we're doing to prevent deconditioning at the Royal Free and Barnet Hospitals and as a trust. Um, so I'm going to talk to you specifically about what we've done at the Royal Free Hospital around the MOVE campaign um, and Emma T is going to talk to you more specifically about one of our big change ideas which was the uh, Royal Free London Chair Watch and Emma Lewis is going to then take it over to talk about sort of the next steps in preventing deconditioning across the trust. So, um, so MOVE, um, this was our campaign against hospital associated deconditioning with the other pandemic. And just to give you a bit of background on this, uh, back in 2016, I attended the first Acute Frailty Network conference, which was um, quite a big turning point, quite a pivotal moment, quite inspiring. There was lots of people there like Liz Sargent, Simon Conroy, and I actually took a picture of this slide, which I now know is part of the Recondition of the Nation evidence slide as well. It looks very, very familiar. Um, and again, this was a real pivotal moment, followed quite soon after by meeting the lovely Brian Dolan, um, who I am a bit of a groupie um, for, and attended a day um, and again, totally inspired. And then Brian came here to the Raw Free and we launched MPJ Paralysis um, campaign on one of our elderly care wards, which had great fun and great energy. Um, we had a great impact to start with as well. But I'll be honest, it was difficult to sustain it. We did do the 70 day campaign. We rolled it against other out on other wards, um, but we weren't really able to sustain it. Um, but we did learn a lot. Then in 2019, I worked with patient flow around D2A and again, brought the idea that actually just by getting patients up and moving, we can really have a big impact on getting them out of hospital. Um, and then we had 2020 and COVID, so it was survival mode, then recovery. Um, but I was desperate once back in my clinical lead OT role to focus on getting people out of bed, preventing deconditioning. And it was a bigger problem than ever. Um, and But there was... Um, 
and energy um sorry for back at 2022 why we started then it took quite a long time but at this point there was a real energy again that had been missing the staffing on the wards were better from a nursing and therapy point of view and most importantly we had the buy-in from our leads across the elderly care wards so our lead consultant and most importantly our wonderful matron cat who was really key um in kicking this off um all the while at barnet they've been well established with their keep me mobile campaign before mpj paralysis and before move um on their elderly care wards which was really about keeping patients mobile keeping them hydrated keeping them nourished keeping them continent and that's something that kept they were continuing to work on that but move was specific to what we wanted to do at the raw free to kick this off again um so the key in doing that was the backing from the, our nursing and therapy leads particularly um why what is the problem i'm not going to speak to this group of people about what deconditioning is um but it was about the fact what we were seeing on the wards um around deconditioning and i think i can um go straight to these case studies because these are really good examples of what actually was a, a patient on one of our wards at the time um that kind of sums up deconditioning it was a lady who was living quite well at home mobile continent um yes she had a diagnosis of dementia when she was 89 she came to the hospital she trapped her finger in a car door and had some plastic surgery and should have gone home again but because of her age and her diagnosis was admitted to an elderly care ward fast forward 48 hours and we're seeing quite significant impact of hospital associated deconditioning so it's a really good example to sum up and we use delia a lot in our training um so what is it that we wanted to do we wanted to keep it simple so we had learned a lot from mpj paralysis um and we wanted to take a lot of that with us but perhaps just change it keep it really simple we just want patients to move mobilize patients occupy them and by that we mean something as simple as having a conversation during covid we worked with our charity the royal free charity and we've continued to supply daily newspapers to the elderly care awards something small but makes a massive difference so having your daily newspaper every day having a conversation and again totally pinched from brian but valuing time so brian talks a lot about time in healthcare being really precious and it's staff time and it's patient time. The recondition of the nation evidence shows how much patient time is spent lying in bed, how much patient time is spent just waiting. So it's really important that we're really valuing that time and we're empowering patients to do what they would normally do in order to get them up and moving and home. Um, so I do honestly believe that if we just got people out of bed, got them moving early, we would we would see an impact on falls, pressure ulcers and on patient flow. So what we were aiming to do on our elderly care wards, um, we started collecting data, how many patients were actually sitting out to bed for lunch? And we found an, on average about a third of the ward was, was sitting out of bed for lunch, even though the majority of them had no reason to be in bed. Um, we were aiming to get 75% 75, 75 of patients out of bed for lunch and hope that we would see a, a reduction in, um, in harm um, and then the number of pressure ulcers and falls and the length of stay for our elderly care patients. So we thought we would do this by communi using communication and awareness, education and training, promoting activity on the wards, looking at our ward environment and engaging with patients and staff about how best to do this. What have we done so far? So we launched this back in October 2022. We started with um, daily 10 at 10 teaching on the ward, at the at the bays, um, at the nurses station. Um, one of the most simple and um, effective things we've done is, is a quiz. So in the bottom left hand corner, you'll see some quiz cards and it's based on all of the evidence that we see in the recondition the nation facts. And it starts a conversation with staff. So we ask, we give out the, the quiz cards and get them to quiz each other and ask them to think what have a think about what the answer is so what percentage of patients are incontinent within 24 hours 48 hours of being on in hospital um and we multiple choice and what they think the answer is and it's always lower than what it actually is which then opens a conversation and we put it into context to the wards that we're working on and you can see the light bulb moment for staff because this is about the raising awareness and the shift from actually where the greatest risk is for patients and it's when they are in bed for too long so and it's encouraging them to make sure that everybody's up and out of bed. We also had our dementia team, our speech and language therapists and dietitians um, doing 10 at 10. And this is still ongoing regularly. It's about making um, time, taking the opportunity to do on the ward um, training. We made sure that we had clear mobility guides for everybody. Um, and we recognised when staff had really worked hard to get people moving so we had a mover of the week award which we're still doing um 18 months in and it's still really popular um in one of these you've got hcas that have 
got all of their patients out of bed. You've got a nurse who attended our 10 at 10 and that day made sure all of her patients were out of bed and they've kept this up as well. Our ward clerk Liz there, who was phenomenal in making sure that we got the chairs that we needed on the ward as well. And you can see Matron Cat, who I mentioned earlier. Um, we amended our certificate because nurses felt they wanted something a little bit more professional to put into their CPD um, folder. So that's really encouraged. This has been really good at encouraging sort of competition, spurring each other on. They're displaying it on the wards as well. But probably one of our biggest successes lately, and I will be honest, I've totally pinched this from Rachel Moran um, um, as, as part of the Recondition the Nation um, on Twitter. And this has been really successful about putting it really in everybody's face. What are we doing? How many patients are sitting out of bed for lunch? This has also been really helpful in getting our nursing colleagues more involved in the data collection every day. So they're doing it at the weekends now, so it's not just the therapist. Um, and we've seen the numbers go up. We've also worked with the charity. Um, so we've got a bid and we had oh, some um, some accessories on the wall to help with promoting more of a rehab approach. This is something really simple, just as foldable tables that we can put in our bays to bring patients together for eating, for meal times, or here in this case for a sing song that went on for hours. Um, and um, but also having so radios, thinking about again how we're occupying patients. And that's one of our dementia specialists who's leading activity sessions on the ward as well. One of the biggest things I mentioned is looking at chairs. So it's all well and good saying let's get more people out of bed. Um, but what are they sitting in? Um, and I'm going to hand over it shortly um, to Emma, who's going to tell you a little bit more about what we've done around the seating. But what have we achieved so far? So this is still ongoing. We're, we are um, almost 18 months in. But as we knew at the beginning, this is about changing culture. This takes time chip, chipping away. Um, but we are starting to see results. So the number of patients out of bed when we started on so our two elderly care wards, the 10 North and 8 West, um, was 40% on 10 North. Then the following couple of months, we managed to get up to 48%. So this is on average, the number of patients sitting out of bed for lunch to 50%, and we're now sitting at 56%. So we've gone from a third to just over half. And that's reflected on 8 West as well. They started off around the 36%. Um, we've gone up to sitting just over half, again, at 54%. But what has this meant for, um, as we mentioned earlier, about the impact that this could have? Um, we've also seen on both elderly care wards, falls are coming down. But what we're also seeing is we've had 12 months on both wards with no moderate harm or above. So, um, Yes, falls are happening. We know falls will always happen. We're never going to stop falls happening. But what we're seeing is an improvement in um, the, the majority of them are no harm or low harm. Um, and with pressure ulcers as well on 8 West, again, this is our frailest population of patients. And we've gone six months again with no harm um, from pressure ulcers, um, which will coincide with the chairs, which we're going to come on to later as well. We've also seen a reduction in length of stay and 8 West during this time period too. Now, I'm not obviously saying all of this is to do with move and getting people out of bed, but it's, it's you know, it's helpful to see that this is all happening at the same time. Um, 10 North again, very similar with falls. Pressure ulcers are coming down quite significantly. Their length of stay hasn't changed massively, but what they have seen is a, an increase in the number of discharges earlier in the day, which as we know is really, really good for flow and for patients to get home earlier in the day. We've had some new recruits, so we've um, expanded from the elderly care wards and therapy and nursing teams are sort of taking what we've done and doing their own thing with it. So 8 North is our MAU um, who had, when they started, four, five, six patients only sitting out of bed for lunch and have had a massive improvement and consistently keeping it in the 20s now, um, which is really good. Um, we have also, um, we had Frailty February recently, so we've launched this on our AAU. Our respiratory ward has just started, so they're collecting data. Our vascular ward has been doing it for a little while, and they've seen an improvement from 50 to 75 percent of patients sitting out of bed for lunch. And our um, trauma and orthopedic ward are doing something slightly more bespoke for the fractured NOF pathways, which is their step and recover program. But again, it's about encouraging um, everybody to get patients out of bed for lunch. So um, I'm not going to go too much 
be telling to what's next because I, I want to hand over to the, the, the two Emmas. Um, but it's more training, it's more raising awareness. That's been the biggest impact is just making people aware of the harm that can come from being in bed and how important it is to empower our patients, get them up, get them moving, getting them home. Um, so ongoing training, um, more um, patient information and more patient involvement as well, continuing to work with the charity and then seating is the, is the next big thing which is going to lead me nicely over to Emma Tarpy who's going to explain what we've done around seating. Thanks Rosie. Um, so I'm Emma, I'm Clinical Manual Handling Advisor at the Royal Free. Um, so running alongside both the Move and the Keep Me Mobile campaigns, we've had an ongoing conversation within the organisation about seating, whether we had the right seating and whether it was appropriate for our patients. So stolen from the Great British Bird Watch, we decided that we would have the Great Royal Free Chair Watch. And this was born because we, what we realised was if we were going to improve seating, we had to understand actually what seating we had and whether it was meeting the needs of our patients. So we ran this on both of our main sites, so Royal Free, and then a few months later, we replicated it at Barnet. And what we asked was that on one day at the same time, it was cross lunchtime, every ward audited the chairs that they had on the ward. Um, they were looking at how many chairs they had, was so mapped against each bed space, and whether their chairs were suitable for the person who was in that bed space at that moment in time. We ran it on a Microsoft Forms and actually we had really good engagement. So at Royal Free, nearly every bed space in the hospital participated in the audit. And then we saw similar when we came to doing it, Barnet, a little bit further along. I'm going to hand over to Emma now. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to talk through, or can you go back a slide, Rosie? Sorry. I'm just going to talk through the um the, the data that we collected. So the the first one being where is the patient? So we noticed that 38%, so this is the Royal Free and Barnet data combined. I'm sorry if there's a bit of um, background noise. Um, that that thirty eight percent of patients were out of bed, which we were hopeful <laughs> would be a little bit more than just the thirty eight percent. And then we looked at the reasons, and the main reason being patient choice, but also medical reasons. Um, so we were just sort of trying to explore a little bit with those. But there was also sort of staffing levels were an issue, not having the appropriate seating for the the patient, um, and then other included um, sort of waiting assessment things like that. Next slide. So um, what we found was that we largely across the two sites had um, high back wooden armchairs, which um, particularly for Barnet Hospital, which has a high older adult population, um, a lot of our patients, although struggle to sit in those kind of chairs. So we actually had more of the recliner, adjustable recliner chairs at Barnet. Um, but largely it was the, the normal sort of high back wooden armchairs. And then the question was, is the chair appropriate? Now, 79% said yes. Um, and so it was largely that, yes, they, these chairs were appropriate. But equally, when we go back and we know that patient choice was an issue of getting out, we wonder whether actually they really are suitable. Maybe they're not comfortable. And actually, that was one of the things that came up, that it wasn't overly comfortable for people to sit in. Um, but also, they didn't meet their postural needs. The transfer method, they, this, these chairs weren't appropriate for um, and their pressure needs as well. Thank you. And then um, one of the other main things that we understood about the, um, the about our patients was the amount of dependency that they have. So patients requiring one or more people to help them to transfer. So, so out of both of the hospitals, only 48 percent were independent. So that meant um, it was actually 40, also 48 percent that um, were requiring assistance of one or two, as some of them were unable or, or weren't assessed at the time. So that's a really large proportion of patients that are needing help to get out of either one or two people and split down into sites. That was 41% at the Royal Free and 60% at Barnet. Thank you. Over to Emma. Thank you. So we identified, having gone through the data, lots of data that we collected from Chairwatch on both sites, we've identified three main work streams that we're taking forward. So the first is our access to specialist seating. So at the time of doing Chairwatch, um, we have, would re ad hoc rent in specialist seating to meet patients' needs as was needed. But what we saw was that that wasn't a very user-friendly process. Um, it was causing us lots of problems from a procurement point of view with mismatched POs and bills not being paid 
feed and suppliers getting upset. So we're looking to move towards having a managed service contract for specialist seating. So the idea being that it will streamline access for the wards to specialist seating in a more timely manner and a more cost effective manner when patients need them. The second was thinking about our standard chairs. And as Emma's mentioned, what we saw is a lot of our chairs were the standard high back armchair, which don't meet the needs of quite a large proportion of our patient population. So what we're doing at the moment is we're reviewing our options for standard chairs. So we're thinking about whether actually having chairs that have a bit more adjustability in terms of height and functionality will meet more of the needs of our patients. And we're putting together a bid, which we're going to take to our medical equipment committee for um, uh, funding to hopefully increase our uh, the number of chairs that we have and the functionality that they have. Um, the third thing that we noticed from doing the chair watch was about preventing deconditioning um, and that obviously only 38% of people were sitting out and that 48% of patients needed assistance to get out. Um, so we wanted to make mobility really as important as giving medications and really try and push that message. So the next steps um, are that there's obviously been um, a lot of work that's happened from both um, the Royal Free and from the Barnet sites. And we've both, I mean, Rosie has approached it from, had an opportunity to approach it from a kind of patient safety perspective to try and really push the message. And I've had an opportunity through our flow, optimising flow programme to kind of really push the message. And where um, we went to our group chief nurse, we sort of raised with her about um, deconditioning and that, that the chairs was just one element of that, but that actually we really wanted a, a, an overarching strategy. So there's been quite a lot of work that's gone on on both sites. And one of the things that's happening at the moment, just to give you a flavour of what's going on at Barnet, is there's a what's called a shift left project, which is um, it's identified that patients are going, more patients are going to care home. So if we can try and get them going either home or home with more with care, um, and that's involving a lead from social services and um, an integrated discharge lead. And um, essentially, they've been doing some projects on, on one particular ward and that's included things like social dining, um, timely mobilisation. Um, think it'd be more proactive about doing using four ATs, uh, all sorts of things just to try and really move and move the the sort of get patients up and moving as much as possible and um, they've had really sort of preliminary findings so far of sort of much more positive patients much more positive staff and looks like it's starting to have a bit of an effect on flow as well so there's a lot going on um, but we recognize that we need to pull this all together as a as a trust so hence when we went to um, our group chief nurse Rosie you're right to move on to the next slide um, we discussed it with her and said we really want some senior leader sponsorship around really trying to create a bit of a group wide strategy um, for preventing deconditioning. And she was, you know, she'd actually already been thinking about it and was really keen that we that we'd um, had this conversation with her and was keen for us to go to what uh, the, the group meeting that's currently happening is the full steering group. Um, and that is across all sites. So we presented there and again had engagement by the um, Director of Nursing to, to try and move this forwards. So it is in preliminary. So that's sort of where we're at with our proposal for preventing a sort of deconditioning strategy for the Royal Free London. Um, and this is kind of how we try to pull it together, really, because we feel that deconditioning is, is kind of the key, the overarching issue um, and there's lots of work going underneath that so we, the move the keep me mobile campaigns the falls free care stop the pressure nutrition and hydration dementia and delirium loads of work is happening but there's something about pulling it together and I think that's we're really um, fortunate that actually you know we've had support to to try and sort of think of a way forwards now with this and we'd be very much sort of saying if you think about the aviation industry um, you know, if if a crash happens, it's too late. And essentially what we're saying is if the pressure sort happens or if a fall happens, it's too late. And how do we really get that sort of preventative um, sort of uh, approach and thinking about how do we measure keeping people mobile consistently and um, so that we can actually make sure that we are preventing harm to our patients. So that's where we're at. Um, so, yeah, watch this space. <laughs> Thank you.
absolutely brilliant and I, and I love the, the the detail and the um the structure that you've just described there uh, and it's a it's a it's really helpful learning for all, for us all really in terms of how you take something which is essentially a a, a really good idea and you've got some enthusiastic people around it you start applying a bit of data that backs it up then you start discussing how you can create this in in, in more of a, a structured but high level structured organizational wide piece of work and you're starting to see that now when we're back from last last month we heard from bristol and then and their active hospitals we've heard from rachel moran who you've uh, recognized in terms of the the work before about the active hospitals work there it's it's a it's a piece of work that is a is a de designed intentional this is how we do things around here and i think the way, way you've described the uh, the component parts. There's lots of uh, lots of work happening all around the country in, in individual hospitals on different parts of, as you described it, on nutrition, hydration, falls, pressure ulcers. But it all feels often quite independent with each other. And I really like how you pulled that together and described it in a in a way which says this is all related to the same the, the same thing. And actually, the um, the preventative thing. I'm more for that. You know, how can we get better at let's stop. Let's stop mopping things up and, and 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 picking things up after after it's happened. How can we avoid it happening in the first? So I love that. Absolutely love that. Um, did I see Kirsty's hand pop up and go back down? You, you, you didn't go shy, did you, Kirsty? Not you, surely. <laughs> no, no, it's OK. Um, okay. No, you've just summed that up. It was basically what I was going to say, Nick. But oh, yeah, sorry. thank you. <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, brilliant. So I'm sure um, the guys won't mind me sharing their slides afterwards. I'll, I'll pull them together, and I'm sure they'll be happy to uh, take any any questions uh, via. Oh, Jane's popped up. Jane. Hi. Yeah. Sorry. I just um, I was having trouble with um, Teams. Then I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to say how, how great it was. Um, I'm 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 Falls Clinical Lead Therapist, and um, we've all, just just it's really interesting because I'm doing lots of chair work and safe, we call it kind of sitting safely work from from regards to falls because this year we've had a massive trend in seeing slips. Um, from chairs um, and uh, and again we're doing lots and lots again of reconditioning work and yeah I just wanted to comment that we've noticed that kind of intersection between between both things and and there's lots of sort of um, I, I genuinely thought that everybody in our hospital knew that we had kind of colour coded chairs for the heights and things like that but actually it appeared that nobody did so I think something I've learned from the work that I was doing is just like don't assume that people know so we were having kind of elderly gentlemen who were six foot two stuck in tiny chairs and then our sort of older ladies with tiny little legs sliding out or you know that sort of thing and, and we, we did some very very basic through Microsoft forms just kind of straw poles on lots of wards and it it just came about that nobody really in the hospital ever really thought about chairs and thought about seating and and I just think it's 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 really interesting so thank you for sharing that's great thanks Jan I think you made a really important point there about something, something quite simple like uh, the chairs audit um it it often clarifies there's a there's a, a term in anybody anybody know or anybody doing any work around human factors will know around workers imagined versus workers done so there's a there's often a work as imagined. We think we know what happens, but then when you un try to understand what actually happens, it's sometimes different. So something that's quite simple as a, as those chairs audit it, is it is it as we thought it was? And as, and I think we could all do that. Could we could all do a really simple uh, chairs audit, even if, even if it's just in a limited area. And I think what Rosie and the two Emmas have shown us is that you can start small and let it grow and grow, and you can then these other other teams and other units wards want to get involved in. So that's really helpful um, demonstration of that. Kate. I just wanted to say it feels like this is such a really sensible, pragmatic approach to a core problem that we see every day. And it feels like I want to write a letter to Jenny Keane that is, should we mandate that every hospital has to do a chairs audit to be able to really highlight this as a problem for every hospital in line with the kind of national work, which is how do I identify how do we identify, yes, there's going to be huge complex different social issues within each different organization but the core foundations of do we have enough chairs do people know where they are do people you know it feels like it feels like one of the outputs from this could be taking this fantastic really really sensible pragmatic core idea and presenting it at NHSE level to be able to say we should mandate that every hospital has to do this to prove that there's a problem because NHSE won't even have thought 
that there aren't enough chairs, will they? I don't know. Um, it just it just feels so sensible. It's, I don't know um, how we do that, but well, that's the that's the. I think so. To start with, I mean, you know, the, we, I'm always caught in between this. Uh, sometimes some some national leadership is good. Uh, other times, just getting on and do some stuff is also good, as as you know very well, Kate. Uh, just 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 cracking on. Uh, so I, I think there's a bit there's a bit of bit of both, and how we can influence. One of the roles of this group is to see how we can do that, um, and we you know and when we will take that suggestion and that idea i think it's a really good idea i think you know how can we feed that into some of the um there is an increasing level of conversation around deconditioning uh, which is which is growing and growing and growing i think uh it can only help throw can in we... suggestions ideas you know thoughts around that which is which is what this group is all about i guess okay could we produce like a template so can we share can we share a template of, you know, a template of how to do it? Like a, I'm, I'm just trying to think of a way of meaning, meaning, because we want to do this at pace, don't we? We know mm. this is a problem, and we're trying to do this proactively for next winter, functionally. I know we never feels like we're out of winter pressures, but I'm just trying to think of if there's, could, Emma, would you be, be, would you be prepared to share all of your? Do you think your trust would be prepared to share all of your resources in a national like project format, and then try and do the kind of Academy of Fab stuff approach, which is produce a packet and then share it across and then try, I mean then we could collect all the data from all the hospitals and how cool would that be that'd be really cool that'd be really good Jenny Keen data that that'd get chairs as part of a funding stream wouldn't it so the first I'm sure we'd be, be so yeah. Nick I just to say I'm sure we'd be happy to share our um the form that we use and the template that we used it was really easy it was well adopted by our staff and it gave us fabulous data so do so you share that with me Emma and I'll circulate yep. that around with the whole group so it's obviously more than just this group, and we'll look with a little note to say, you know, this is what we've we've done, and see see where where that goes. Amit. And and uh, thanks, Kate and uh, Emma and uh, others for such a brilliant session. Um, Kate, just to answer your question, we are working closely with Jenny Keane and colleagues about some community improvement programs at the moment. So. Uh, but this is a very good idea, and uh, once we have some more information, we will actually take it forward. And 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 thank you, Rosie and Emma, for doing this fabulous work. Brilliant. That's um, I love how these things just sprout out of nowhere and just flies. Excellent. Exactly why we're doing this this work. It is about a social movement. Um, first and foremost, which is what we always intended it to be. And uh, you are you guys are just uh, picking it up brilliantly. So thank you for that. I'll keep on saying it. I'd be pretty lonely if I sat here on my own every other month speaking to a blank screen. So thank you for that. Right, uh, cracking on, Jackie. Are you are you poised and ready? Hello. Oh, yes. I'm going to see Jackie and her team uh, in UHB, and I'll share that the link to that video uh, in the chat in a moment once uh, once Jackie's got got started. Uh, some of the great work that um, that Jackie has been leading uh, at a, quite a um, I mean, it's a massive organisation, and um, the enthusiasm from, from not just Jackie but her team as well in in driving this work and and the, and the learning that's come about from that has been uh, has been phenomenal. So, Jackie, over to you. Well, thank you so much. Um, so I am talking today about sort of the rebranding and evolution of Eat, Drink, Dress, Move as a result of our engagement with the Recondition the Nation initiative um, back in November 2022. Um, and it's really nice to, to hear Rosie and Emma's talking about their work because ours is very similar but slightly different. So it's it's good to see that we're doing similar things, um, but just branding it in a different way for, for our kind of settings. Um, so Eat, Drink, Dress, Move was actually an initiative that came out about 10 years, if not more, um, ago. And it was initially led by therapies at UHB uh, to prevent deconditioning, um, with a lot of these things kind of died off and it, it didn't kind of pick back up again and the men momentum was lost. Um, so having been involved in the Recondition the Nation initiative, it felt like the right time to rebrand this and promote the principles in line with preventing deconditioning again. Um, 
so aging just move is an approach to care that should be everybody's responsibility as we've kind of touched upon in that last talk it's it's bringing together everybody's roles and responsibilities to prevent deconditioning um, and that's including patients themselves their family members and and the staff that are caring for them um, and it is what it says on the tin it's encouraging patients to eat well drink well um, get dressed into some day clothes and footwear um, and move and be as independent and self-caring as possible whilst they recover actively in hospital. So I wanted to speak today about how we've kind of gone about rebranding this and promoting Eat, Drink, Dress, Move um, off the back of the Recondition the Nation work. Um, and I've recently come across this John Hopkins um, Activity and Mobility Promotion Programme um, paper, which provides a systematic approach to implementing programmes like this. Um, and reading through, I actually realised that a lot of the things that they suggest that you do to try and generate this kind of culture and systematic approach to um, promoting mobility, we had actually tapped into through this work. So it was quite nice to kind of retrospectively reflect on what we've done up until this point um, and consider how we've tapped into each of these components. Um, so the first was creating a shared priority and for that um, it meant for us that we were creating um, a resource, responsibility for everybody to promote reconditioning and prevent deconditioning. Um, we engaged the more senior members of the multidisciplinary team um, to kind of lead by example um, if we had engagement at kind of team lead senior level um, those that work with us and underneath us um, kind of were more empowered to, to follow us and and engage as well um, and it meant that we could highlight the clinical benefits around quality of life level of dependence um, therapy needs and care on discharge as well as safety and quality elements such as those falls, pressure sores and things that we've just discussed um, and the cost reduction benefits um, when you're looking at length of stay and readmission rates. So how did we achieve this? Well, as I said, we engaged in the Recondition the Nation um, initiative and that gave me kind of a way in to introduce this to um, everybody in my team um, and kind of get them thinking about how we as a team can start off um, considering improvement ideas. So um, we've got everyone to kind of make a pledge at the start of the Recondition the Nation initiative. Um, and throughout the last year or so, I've also taken the opportunity to kind of hold staff accountable to making positive changes to their practice. Again, striving to make it everybody's responsibility to think of little ways of how they can promote these principles um, and strive for, you know, like the medal awards or a certificate of excellence, which we've produced for staff who demonstrate um, their ability to promote these principles. Um, another way of creating a shared priority has been through training, education and raising awareness. And this has involved delivering ad hoc ward based training to nursing staff, promoting that importance of tackling frailty and deconditioning to ensure it's a priority for um, for all of the staff on the ward. And during this training, we'd tap into discussions around clinical benefits, safety, quality, and the impact on cost reduction as well. And finally, engaging um, those senior members of staff in a frailty and deconditioning MDT working group. Um, and in this, we can discuss any barriers that we're facing, any further quality and improvement ideas. Um, and again, like I say, just encourage leaders to really push this message out to all of their staff across the multidisciplinary team. So the next component was around identifying barriers. Um, so that means assessing barriers and implementing uh, to implementing eat, drink, dress, move and reconditioning and trying to work together to kind of mitigate those barriers. So again, how have we done that? Um, through the Frailty and Deconditioning MDT Working Group, we all came up with a very simple staff survey that we could um, give out to staff to get answers around what we're doing well, what we could do better and then establish some themes. So we asked some very simple questions. What would make your working day easier? What do we do well in relation to preventing frailty and deconditioning? What makes it harder? What could we do better in relation to frailty and deconditioning? Um, what are some of those barriers to doing better? Um, and as I say, from this, we could establish some themes as to what um, was crop cropping up quite frequently. And I also use similar questions in the um, training education and raising awareness sessions, um, sort of asking, what do you know about frailty and conditioning? What can we do? Um, and if there's any barriers to doing that at the moment, as well as some things that you might try and do moving forward. 
Um, so from those themes that we established, uh, we came up with some change ideas, um, which are listed here. So um, very quickly, kind of going through what we have implemented, um, we wanted to manage expectations of patients and relatives um, for their inpatient admission, moving away from patients coming into rest to moving, keeping active, maintaining independence. So I generated some movement matters, information leaflets for patients to have on the wards um, and eat, drink, dress, move posters, which could be displayed around the ward um, and got some really good uh, patient and staff feedback on these. So that's been rolled out now across the trust. Um, we wanted to use our day rooms as places for patients to use rather than how they've been used over you know, COVID and the pandemic um, for kind of office space and meeting spaces. Um, so one really lovely example is from Harborn Ward, um, which has been turned into a Peaches Diner um, for patients to come and do exercise activities. We've got a knit and natter session um, and it's just a nice social space to tap into the social elements of, um, of being in hospital as well. Um, and again, it kind of taps into staff well-being and morale at work. Everyone really loves going to this um, day room now and spending a bit of time with their patients. Um, breaking their day up a little bit, you know, popping in as and when they can. Um, we've also really promoted group ward based exercise classes. So reintroducing these um, to support staff and patients kind of break their day up from that grind of having to discharge plan and, and consider patient flow and tapping into again that kind of patient experience um, and staff morale. And as I said, training, education and raising awareness has remained a sustainable improvement change. Um, and the initial training that I delivered um, has now expanded into an eat, drink, dress, move study day. So an entire day, um, as well as sessions being delivered on rolling programmes for the wider multidisciplinary team. So the eat, drink, dress, move study day takes the form of um, a morning session where a lot of talks are delivered um, around different roles within AHPs and nursing um, in relation to eat, drink, dress, move. And then the afternoon takes on the form of a practical session where we can build staff confidence to measure and provide mobility aids um, and risk assess to safely mobilise and transfer patients, even in the absence of physio. So over the weekends or in the evenings when patients are admitted. We continue to work on providing a ward stock of mobility aids and equipment to once again kind of promote nursing staff to uh, safely transfer and mobilise patients in the absence of therapists. For example, if a patient came in um, who normally walks with a Zimmer frame, but they've had to leave that at home for some reason, um, you know, and there's nothing kind of to indicate that there should be a change in mobility, can the nurses risk assess and provide that aid to maintain that mobility when they come in before having been seen by a physio. Um, and we've also looked at standardising the uh, MDT and board round standards to highlight patients at risk of deconditioning and those that need more therapy input to support that patient flow um, and ultimately prevent deconditioning. And these um, new standards have kind of focused on a more holistic approach to the patients rather than just focusing on what's going on medically and what else needs to be done medically we get more input from different multidisciplinary team members in uh, in these meetings now. Um, and we've also in introduced an eating dress mood student physio placement model um, during which students um, on their first placement come in and experience the nursing handover, support with functional activities and meal times, and deliver some group and one-to-one -one physiotherapy interventions. So in terms of education, training and raising awareness, um, as I said, we've delivered a lot of training to um, nursing staff, but also the wider multidisciplinary team and using these sessions to address any barriers identified and sort of consider how we can mitigate these. So as I touched on, we've got the eating, dress, move study day and the frailty and deconditioning training on rolling programmes. Um, as well as these, we've used the um, Eating Dress Move launch event that we did in the atrium to raise awareness. Again, trying to capture different staff members and visitors walking past our stand to encourage them to promote these principles in, in their families, um, with their relatives in hospitals, and also staff on different clinical areas around the hospital, rather than just in healthcare of older people. And we've also uh, created a staff intranet page 
which has access to different resources on there, such as the posters and information leaflets for staff to print out and use all across the hospital. In terms of measurement, so the John Hopkins programme sort of suggests having common metrics um, and standardising the measurement of mobility across all multidisciplinary teams. Um, and this kind of came in the form of the My Movement boards that we've generated. So kind of like a tick list um, that can be put up in and around the bed spaces for patients to feel um, that they can achieve some of these tasks during the day and prompt um, patients and staff to kind of remind patients to, to be getting up and staying active. Um, and in the future, I'd like to consider a few more common kind of outcome measures um, in how we measure mobility and we measure activity during patients sort of daily routines. So then in terms of champions and advocates, um, this can be in the form of like a mobility team, um, a team which can link in with ward managers and, and the nursing and therapy teams and champion that integrative effort to promote safe mobility. So for us, uh, I've worked closely with the ward managers to identify some eat, drink, dress, move champions um, who each get an eat, drink, dress, move badge. Um, and a lot of staff are really kind of jealous of those that have had an eat, drink, dress, move badge and want to kind of get one for themselves by doing that promotion work and getting involved. So it is a, um, a sought after badge that everyone wants to try and engage with, which is nice. And as I said, we've also de developed a certificate of excellence for staff that go um, above and beyond to promote those eat, drink, dress, move principles in their work to try and spark, again, that um, empowerment and that um, advertising and promoting of these um, principles for everybody to kind of do and, and feel able to, to promote. In terms of workforce uh, workflow integration, we want to try and communicate patient mobility through whatever existing methods there are, raise awareness of patients' current uh, mobility status and, and future goals, and educate the patient on the importance of working towards these. So this is a, we've achieved this through the MDT and board round standards, making sure that we're commenting on mobility and functional goals through the therapy team, um, but also trying to encourage the medical teams to document some specific therapy goals, such as sit out for lunchtime or mobilise to the bathroom, rather than just writing PTOT, because the ward staff will tend to just pick up on um, what the doctors are writing. And we thought that if they can kind of facilitate um, with the goal setting, then actually that would help us um, to shift that culture um, and get them to focus on the more uh, functional activities throughout the day. And as I say, we've got the eating, dress, move posters and patient information leaflets that can spread that message as well. Um, similar to what the guys have just talked about in terms of their data feedback, data is really good to um, review and evaluate how you're getting on with these kind of initiatives, um, but also to identify what barriers there are to meeting these goals um, and again review what we can do better. Um, so we've looked at things like percentage of patients that are out and dressed by lunchtime. Um, this is an example of before and during our aging dress move student placement. Uh, we've looked at the level of dependence on admission versus discharge, as well as the initial discharge pathway plan on initial assessment versus the actual pathway that they go home on. Um, and again, this was before and during a student placement, which um, was around sort of aging dress move. And you can see that actually um, level of dependence um, improved overall during um, having these students on the ward um, and discharge pathways in terms of that level of support on, on discharge improved as well. We've also looked at the number of therapy contacts when we've had these, these students in these specific roles on the ward um, and you can see that that really jumped up again um, in terms of how many physio contacts we could, we could provide um, and obviously looking at things like length of stay and patient and relative um, feedback on, on some of these initiatives. And then finally, brand promotion and awareness. Um, so having a consistent design and colour themes, which I've tried to um, harness in this presentation, um, is really key to kind of developing that brand. Um, and as I said, we've rebranded each and dress move. We've got the posters, information leaflets. We've even, uh, one of our lovely OT assistants, uh, bake some cookies for us with the Eating Dress Move logo on. So there's that consistency across all of our kind of resources and promotion work that um, people can recognise what that is. And I'm a huge advocate of 
things like this, sharing all of our work. Um, and that's uh, what Nick was talking about, the link to our podcast that we've recently filmed together um, on there. But yeah, sharing across all different platforms, um, across Twitter, we've got both mine and our team HCOP um, at UHB Twitter that you can follow um, because there is some really great work going on out there that um, we, we need to share and we need to um, learn from as well. So in terms of top tips, just very quickly, um, I would say branch out from your workplace network, find what you're passionate about, um, get that buy-in and engagement from the wider MDT and, and think about how we can use both registered and non-registered staff, students and future workforce. Um, establish an overall theme and an aim that everybody can buy in to and kind of make their priority. Give all things a go. Um, start small, work smart, not smart, not hard. And expect to kind of hit barriers, but don't be disheartened by that. Try and think about how you can work together to get around those. And then don't shy away from shouting about it and celebrating your success. And that's me. Brilliant, Jackie. Just a great story uh, from from UHB. Um, for people think of, thinking of any questions they might have, want to pop their hands up. I want to just. I know Jackie won't won't uh, won't say this, but because she's far too humble, um, Jackie hasn't gone about asking permission for any of this, and it's it's all about what is in her own circle of control, and pushing that as far as possible, really pushing the boundaries of that. Um, uh, so all that activity there is a is is the enthusiasm and connection, but you know just go. Uh, you know top tips there, just trying things, seeing seeing where you connect with people, encouraging people, enthusing people, and all that you've just described. That is that is in the absence of any kind of. The, Jackie didn't go to the chief nurse, for example, or or the or the, or the comms team or the training department and and ask for any of the any, ask permission to go and do all that. Um, it's just about cracking on and trying trying some things and I think we all have a degree of that uh, within our gift uh, to try and push that so anybody got any questions for Jackie it's been Go absolutely ahead. amazing uh, Jackie the the way your career has developed and the way you've adopted this work is absolutely stunningly amazing and inspirational so uh, I'm sure you'll you'll go a very long way and uh, we will be closely watching how you develop your skills and influence further in this field so and thank you very much thank you so much and if in case uh, Jackie hasn't mentioned uh, uh, being humble she is, she also was a runners up at the last year's HSJ uh, Patient Safety Awards for this work. So well done. And once again, I want to stress the point, once again, in the context of a massive organisation, QE Hospital in Birmingham is huge. Um, I've got lost there many times. So, uh, you know, it's, it's about what, understanding what you can influence uh, and as I say your, your own circle of control um, Jackie wasn't looking to change the world boil the ocean whatever analogy you want to you want to use it's around healthcare of older people and that was her area of influence and it wasn't about trying to change everything so uh, that, I think that was a massive learning point uh, I think it's Geraldine first and then Jane thank you Nick and thank you Jackie it is such a pleasure to hear you um, and I know when we've gone to the various events and people have asked, OK, what, you know, in terms of how has this landed and are, what have we seen as a consequence? So it's it's always wonderful to see all the work that goes on in terms of the prevention, decondition and the agenda. But equally, what's important is about growing future leaders. And and I think we're incredibly proud of you and everyone on the call and beyond that are leading on this important agenda because it's good leadership that lands this and it's how you lead and how you bring people together for the greater cause um and and i, I was very struck i was in in somewhere last week and you know the, the physios were saying actually we're really finding struggling how to engage with the nursing teams to be able to land this so it'd be really interesting to hear how you have done that so in terms of getting them really on board and knowing why this mattered, because in terms of continence care, the eating and the drinking and all of those, how did you kind of land it to say, actually, this really matters? Because that shows true leadership style in all its glory. Oh, thank you. That's really nice feedback. Um, I think initially, again, it kind of comes back to starting small and 
um, not imposing a change on people, but actually hearing what is difficult um, at the moment to do X, Y, and Z. Obviously, there's that element of training and education around the theory behind frailty and deconditioning. Um, but it's all very well knowing all the theory, but then when you try and apply that practically and you're like, oh, but I can't do this because of this and I can't do that because of this. So I think it's really important to get that engagement. You need to listen and hear what people are struggling with to begin with and then almost propose it as, um, well, let's work together then and figure out how we can move around this rather than, um, you know, you've got to go and do this. We're not doing this well enough. Um, figure it out for yourself kind of thing. Um, I was very much from the get go wanting this to be a wider multidisciplinary team thing. And I think um, in healthcare of older people, we're so fortunate that we've already got that buy in. I think we're already quite valued as therapists with with geriatricians and with the nursing staff that um, it, that made it a lot easier to kind of approach, um, you know, my ward managers, matrons, the clinical service lead consultant um, about some of these things. Um, but yeah, I would just I would just say start very small. Don't kind of come in thinking you've got to go and do this now. Go figure it out. Try and work together to unpick some of those barriers first and then think of the ideas um, to implement after that. Brilliant, really great advice. Always love a bit of starting small and letting it grow. Uh, don't impose things on people. It's uh, always a killer. Uh, Jane. Uh, really great work, Jackie. Um, I'm a physio as well. And um, I was just wondering um, how, what impact did this have on your kind of ability to complete your normal caseload? Because at the moment we're sort of, we've done something quite similar um, in Doncaster, but we're wanting to roll it out onto other wards and I think quite a lot of the barriers are about the negative effect it might have on kind of um, physios carrying their normal caseload and how much extra work this would be and I just wonder what your experience of, of that has been. Yeah something that um, I commonly get asked and I think um, it comes back to that culture and shifting mindsets um, mm -hmm. and I think like um, Geraldine just mentioned in terms of leadership that there's so many elements to this kind of work that um, helps to develop staff and their skills and their knowledge and awareness of how we can provide care. Um, so it's not just the, the idea itself and the, the task itself um, that is developing, but actually the people that are doing that work are developing too, um, and that multidisciplinary team work as well. So I think as a, as a therapy team, um, we're often, uh, left to kind of lead on these things but getting that engagement from the wider multidisciplinary team takes that pressure off the therapy yes. service um, and it, again comes back to that first point of making it um, a shared priority if you have that overarching theme that overarching aim that each discipline is feeding into it's not just a physiotherapy uh, team's job to do it um, so getting that buy-in um, creating that shared priority takes that pressure off because the caseloads are always going to be there and you're always going to feel like you're never on top of it and you're um, you know you're, you're not um, seeing enough patients or doing enough with the patients but shifting that mindset to okay how can I do things slightly differently and reap different benefits from it um, is helpful to not kind of face that moral distress of I'm not doing enough yes um, and a lot of all these um, ideas and changes tap into staff well-being you know you see pe people in Peaches Diner now that we've got in Harborn really loving walking in there and actually that's what gets them up in the morning to go and help with breakfast club um, so you're tapping into then enjoyment at work as well and not feeling that burden of the caseload because you're doing something different um, but I always reinforce to my team that the, the patients are unfortunately always going to be there as soon as you discharge one someone else is in um, but how can we work a little bit differently and together with the wider MDT to shift our mindset towards what we do in our job um, and what our role is because we're not just discharge planners and we're not just flow coordinators we're physiotherapists um, so yeah just shifting mindsets and and culture but that's really difficult so it is yeah thank you though great answer and very very much yeah i feel like yeah i'm i'm thinking those things too so it's just nice to know that you thought them of experience them but actually managed to to kind of square that circle with it all so thank you thanks so mm. much 
Yeah, great, great answer, Jack. I think the the point about the moral injury is a really important one. How we, you know, that the your teams feeling like they're actually they're achieving something, and you know, one looking forward to coming to work. That that those feelings are are really important. Um, and getting that joy in work again, I think I picked that up when I came to see you. There's a real sense of that in in the room, but also about that. This is how we do things around here. This is business as usual now. You know, within the board rounds, those conversations you're, you're having, this is just how we do things. And I guess it takes, not necessarily it takes the responsibility, but it takes the onus off you as a therapist. Who all, it almost feels like, oh, well, that's a therapy job. And but it's 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 going back to this is everybody's job, and it's incorporated into those conversations. So. Thank you for that. And thank you for sharing all your work as well. And it's obviously been all over Twitter. And I know that you did um, in your design work, you put that out on Twitter as well to get people's feedback. So um, that's a very brave thing to do, to put that out on social media to, to ask for feedback. Uh, but in that sharing uh, mode and that sharing sort of mindset, uh, I know that Cindy uh, and the team at Rotherham have picked up some of the thinking to build on the work that you're already doing uh, up at Rotherham, Cindy. So I'm going to so over to you now and you can share what you're, you're up to in your patch. Thanks, Nick. Can you see the presentation OK? Yeah. Okay? So some of the work we've been doing at Rotherham um, links very strongly to patient experience because in my role as Deputy Chief Nurse, I've got responsibility for quite a large portfolio. One of those is patient experience and I've been here for about two and a half years. And what we found was there was a definite need to improve what that felt like for our patients. So analysing data from complaints, concerns, CQC surveys, but also I think post COVID, we were getting that increase in long length of stay for older people and probably a bit of a need to relaunch the principles of NG paper, NG, uh, PJ paralysis. So in April last year, we had a rapid improvement discharge event. So we built up some quality improvement capacity and we had about 80 staff off site every day for a week and used the Mrs Andrews story last thousand days. I know they've been around for a while, but it felt like we wanted to explore what people understood about those. Did these resonate and what we were going to do about it? That then led to a trust-wide person-centred care study day. So we called it person-centred care because it was about the people we look after, not the clinical conditions. But in that, we, we, we cover reconditioning, dementia, delirium, nutrition, hydration, continence, mobility. We purchased an interactive frailty suit so people could actually experience what it might feel like to have frailty in hospital and how disorientating and just how difficult it is to even move and um, leading into end of life care as well so you can see some of the slides there we've had over 300 staff attend so far so through that day we've managed to um weave into it some of the work we're trying to do so thinking about having more open visiting times across the trust signing up to john's campaign um, definitely doing lots of work to reduce noise at night because patients were saying it's really hard to recover when it's so noisy at night you can't sleep um how can we look after um dentures hearing aids glasses eyes his teeth how can we improve hydration We've got a traffic light water um lid system and using um information boards to try and help educate patients and families because they were saying give us more information we want to help we've got the bedside books and then having done a bit of analysis on actually there was quite a large number of our patients who had been veterans and got the veteran aware accreditation which we're building towards silver now and thinking about accessible information as well um and then we were weaving this into the person centered care day and getting lots of feedback so um, people were very honest and open and the bedside boards that we got we got in place weren't particularly helpful. They've been there for 15 years. So we've tried to make them really simple now. So a patient's name, preferred name, the consultant's name, what is their mobility, what are the dietary needs and what notes we want. So we didn't want more and peace. That goes in the clinical records, but something that anybody who is part of that multi-professional team can see at a glance. What staff were then telling us was that um, some strange rule had been put in place a number of years ago where patients in ABA all had to share the same walking aid. So it didn't matter whether you were needed a frame or a, or a stick or to walk with assistance or if you were tall or you were short, you all had to share this one walking aid. So we're able to do lots of myth busting. I don't know why it happened or how it's happened, but from now, everyone is assessed for their own walking aid and then we communicate that on the mobility board and backed up in the clinical records. Um, we did some work with um, 
South Yorkshire Transport and they came in and designed some bus stocks for two of our older people's wards. So it just got people away from the bedside and they used local landmarks in that as well. They did it for absolutely nothing. From the eyes, ears, teeth, bags then, some of the feedback was that they were a bit too big and belongings rattled around, so we got the boxes in. And we got a local community helping us knit the twiddle muffs because they had somehow got banned in the trust. But actually, let's bring them back. It's absolutely fine. People are sensible. We can do some quality control. So we, we started to talk about people being community ready. So our discharge lounge got rebranded as the community ready unit. So we're trying to get people less to think about discharge length of stay and more about getting back into that community setting. We've got the discharge to assess and the expansion of our virtual ward, which has been a real success for us here at Rotherham. Um, other bits as well that have cost us nothing, the, the dogs as therapy. So we did have pets as therapy for staff, but actually our patients getting them out of bed, getting them moving. And, and we've seen some absolutely extraordinary reactions to the dogs when they've come in our wards. And some of our patients with dementia who've been really incommunicative have started to verbalise and talk to us when the dog arrives. And then we brought Sharon in who does the hairdressing and she comes um, sits on two wards once a week and then patients pay, but they get their own hair done. So we're trying to build this story to patients that you look your best when you're up and dressed. And that being our theme. So building into the reconditioning games, um, we had Catherine here last year, Catherine Hooby, and we got um, quite a few awards nominated for recondition awards. And we have themed inpatient tea parties. So last we do nutrition and hydration week every year and we've done that for the past three years while I've been here um, and we also do one for remembrance around the November time then there's been a few occasions that perhaps you wouldn't always plan for so we had the Queen's Jubilee and then we had the King's Coronation last year so we do like a themed tea party and it gets the whole ward involved so patients get a bit more to eat and drink we've got charitable funds to, to um, buy a afternoon tea for people or a textured diet alternative but they all had a bit of a theme and then we get them a teapot hamper for the winning ward that does the best effort with all of that. Um, they get patients to measure their steps with their own smartphones and things. So some of the wards um, were giving out stickers to patients once they'd, once they'd reached so many steps. And we had a walk to Windsor for the King's coronation. And then we've even had um, uh, all sorts of things um, last week for nutrition and hydration. We did a walk round, a race round Rotherham. So every step that every patient did, they could plot to a Rotherham map. So it was linked to the local community as well. Bit of fun for everybody involved. So we're trying to think for how do we build all these messages together? And then we saw the work that Jackie had shared on Twitter and I had a light bulb moment. This is it. These are the messages we've been trying to promote and trying to get people to move towards. So we contacted comms at um, Birmingham and asked if they'd be kind enough to share us their graphics and they were really kind. So they just took their logo off and sent it us and said, if you're going to use it, just credit us because that'd be really great. Um, but it had all the messages on that we were trying to share and the message we were trying to promote across the trust, not just with staff, but with patients and with families as well. So we got the boards um, and we launched it all during Nutrition and Hydration Week. So we had Eat, Drink, Dress, Move Monday <laughs> for the launch, tying into the Global Tea Party. Um, a little bit more work that we've managed to do. So with all the um, communication on the person-centred care day, we actually give all the attendees um, their first break uh, drinking the plastic spouted beaker to send the message of not very nice is it can you imagine being a patient and you lay down in bed and actually all you want to do is sit up and have a drink in a, in a cup that you would normally like to do so this week we've managed to now finally remove all our plastic spouted beakers there's a small stash in our speech and language therapy office um, but they've gone and we've bought some new mugs so a larger single handled mug for people to be able to do and a lighter double handed mug so the message is about positioning your patient so they can drink and stop giving them the beaker so everybody that's been to the person centre care days now got the eat drink dress move badge and you are now our ambassadors we've made a bit of a fuss so the team have gone out there to give them the badges so we've got over 300 um, out there in the trust so lots of work going on, but I think all the work that Jackie's just explained is just absolutely fantastic. And to be able to have that as it is and lift it into a new trust and be able to say thank you very much. This trust for the work that you've done, um, we can then continue to spread that good work and message in other organisations. It's a bit short and sweet, but happy to take any questions. Oh, brilliant, Cindy. It's just a really great example, though, of um, 
you know, all, all the ingredients are there. Sometimes it's about pulling it together and, you know, and, and, and frame it in a way which, which people can get behind, you know, and, and then you, you know, obviously bought in the eating just move uh, materials, but, you know, from what you described before, there's, um, there's so many similarities, it, but it's just about how you can pull it together and, and find that, uh, that that common aim. Any uh, anybody got any questions for uh, Cindy? Just while I sort of think think about it, is that I'm mean, just popping up? Go on. Uh, thank you, Cindy. It was such, such a amazing one, such a simple idea, but such brilliantly executed. And I really, really love you. Look your best when you are up and dressed. It's absolutely amazing. So now, thank you, for, thank you for what you're doing. It's just really, really amazing work. It's it's the it's the um it's the comment that, that I know uh, Brian Brian Darren would always say about it. it's the it's the uniform we put people in when they go into hospital we put people in pajamas because that's the uniform we put people in and um you know it's is it always necessary I think we have to ask those questions I think just challenging some of those pre I love I love the way that there's that challenge of they, these myths that occur in the these you know the banning of the twiddle muffs or the whatever it might be that myths just appear out of nowhere and, and sometimes you have to smash these myths uh, yeah to... i think the assessment of the walking aids was the one that shocked me the most how we got into a position where it became accepted that everybody in the bay would share the same walking aid so we were able to put that to bed immediately and get the message out there no we don't want you to do that we want patients to be assessed for what they need. if they can walk let them walk absolutely uh, jane Oh, yeah. Um, I, sorry, I used to work at Rotherham and that sounds ridiculous, the whole sharing a walking aid thing. I wonder if it was during COVID or something, Cindy? I don't know. Somebody said it came from infection prevention and control and I thought, oh, that's really interesting because I'm assistant Dipsy and it's definitely not come from me. So it sounds it, wild. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. <laughs> We're not doing it, it, so not, let's move on. I, I, I just think... really wanted to ask you about your, um, your eyes, uh, ears and uh, teeth boxes because uh, particularly eyes and ears is obviously like a, uh, you, I know you're at Doncaster seeing so you know about the five for falls it, it's just such a five for falls thing isn't it and um, mm -hmm. you know it's that's something that at the moment I'm really trying to to to, to get um, making sure that patients come into hospital with a with some good slippers with their own walking aid as soon as possible if possible but I love the eyes ears and teeth boxes um, are they cardboard or yeah. so like single there's, patient there's quite, use there's quite a few I think there's quite a few trusts that have, have got them, but there's love companies it. that do it. The bags didn't really work for us because people found mm. them too big. Although I did see lots of people going home with them, the little eyes, teeth bag and a slipper sock. And some of people had take the bedside information as well as like a bit of a goodie bag on discharge. But um, the <laughs> boxes, I think, are used much better because they're smaller mm. and, and the glasses, the hearing aids, the dentures rattle around in it a little bit less. Yeah. So we're just wanting people to look after them because... When you read the literature, they do get tucked into pillowcases or Absolutely. into rubbish bags, and, and it's quite hard to keep things. Um, it can often be quite um, um, a, a common source of family complaints as well, can't it? Losing yeah. hearing aids, and, and, and you know, I know that that can often be, and certainly to push the whole, you know, getting out of bed safely and having those things, that's great. Um, would you mind like maybe email me and sharing where you managed to source those from yeah, so yeah. I could look into yeah, it? Yeah. Thanks, Cindy. I think there's only one of me in the NHS, so thank you. If you send the details to me as well, Cindy, I'll I'll put it out on the um I'll circulate it around everybody. To, Amazing, to thank you. I love it. I love it. Really, really great. Any other questions before we um wrap things up? Brilliant. Thanks to all speakers today just another just one of my best favorite meetings that i come to it's just brilliant i just love hearing all this 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 great work and the sharing and the learning that you get off each other um deb whitaker's had to drop off the call unfortunately but she was going to talk very briefly about mental health uh, awareness week um this year i've got a she sent me over her single slides so just bear with me I'm, I'm working off a laptop so i'm just going to try and share uh share the the screen there we go so this was deb's uh, slide so mental health awareness week uh, this year the theme is around movement moving more for our mental health i think a lot of us understand the impact on our mental health uh, from from activity and how that has a benefit so what we're looking for is um, any particular ideas or, or i can encourage you all to to think about what we might do for 
mental health awareness week which is from the 13th to the 19th of of, um, of may all around you know linking this the work that we do movement the, the deconditioning we can think about you know deconditioning of our mental health as well in terms of what what we what we uh, think about and how we can maybe push this push this work link it to existing work give it a reason to give a bit of a boost um it's about uh, we've talked about well-being of our of our of our teams as well how we can link it into uh, greater levels of satisfaction in our work um and also for our for our patients and the people that we work with so um uh, uh, an encouragement a, a a pitch to you guys um if you want to sort of think of something which is a bit of a, a, a uh, an energy or a bit of a, a bit of a project for this year then we can link this to uh, mental health uh, awareness week so that's that's in in may so have a think about have a think about that see what what you might uh, be able to come up with uh, share ideas on the whatsapp group if you want to or have a chat on the whatsapp group use this chat uh, to to can carry on the conversation and um, but maybe there's something you can link uh, as, as another as another initiative just for that particular week to, to raise awareness again so a little bit of pitch from from deb and myself uh, if that's okay right we've got a bit of time back today which is uh, helpful you can go off and go have a nice cup of tea in non in no beakers please cindy we'll have we'll have proper mugs go and have, have, a, have a cup of tea or a coffee um pop to the toilet for change that's a nice thing to just have a, a go to the toilet have a have, have five minutes so um as i said last time at the, early, at the start of the meeting moving now to monthly so you're going to be one hour um, on a monthly basis rather than the hour and a half every other month so the next one is uh, the 15th i think it's 15th or 16th of april top of my head memory's not that good these days but we're going to run those monthly see how that goes yeah these are all these are all tests trials see how we get on uh, we've got so much stuff to share so if you want to share your stuff just ping me an email let me know and um, and we'll get you on the agenda april's full but we are looking to fill uh, may so if you've got stuff you want to talk about please do let me know but if that's all for this month i'll wish you all a good afternoon have a Good rest of the week. Those of you who got some time off next week, enjoy it for Easter, uh, and um, and we'll see you all in April. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. Have Thank a lovely you. Bye bye.